Thank you. Um, once again, um, I just wanted to say good morning to everyone and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar to introduce our latest offerings of research and clinical grade um, MSCs from Repressel and Histocell. And um, like Bob said, my name is Evelyn Chukura. I'm a stem cell scientist at Repressel USA, and I'll be taking you through the first part of the talk, going over research grade MSC. So I want to begin um, by briefly introducing MSCs. I want to begin by briefly introducing MSCs. Um, for those in the audience who are not quite familiar with MSCs, and for those who are, it's going to be a brief refresher. So MSCs are multipotent adult cells, and they can be induced to differentiate into various cells in the mesoderm lineage. Although there are studies that indicate that at least in vitro, they can also be induced to differentiate into cells in the ectoderm lineage, such as neurons. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to limit all the discussion of MSCs to the mesoderm cell lineage. Um, MSCs can also be isolated from multiple sources, and the most common of them are bone marrow and adipose tissue, but they've also been successfully isolated from uh, umbilical cord blood and dental pulp, among others, and they've been cultured extensively ex vivo. Um, over the last 20, year, 20 years, I should say, there's been an increased demand for MSCs and MSC-derived products, and this has been mostly tied to two functions that MSCs have been shown to play. The first is that MSCs have been shown to play significant roles in tissue regeneration and remodeling after injury. And the second is that MSCs have been uh, shown to modulate the immune responses of cells within the immediate vicinity of the tissues that they reside in. And these two functions have been tied to what MSCs put out. Um, these include cytokines, um, as well as extracellular vesicles, such as exosomes, which are of course, you know, very uh, in demand nowadays. With these two functions, there have been several clinical studies um, of MSCs. <clears throat> And the clinical studies involving MSCs play off these two roles. So a first a clinical study would typically be involved in uh, using MSCs or MSC-derived exosomes as therapy um, for tissue regeneration, again, after injury. And the second is to help reduce inflammation, particularly in diseases where inflammation is a strong component, such as graft versus host disease. So when we look at uh, MSCs under the microscope, they look very much like fibroblasts. They have the uh, spindle-shaped morphology. And the picture that you can see on the left are some of the MSCs that we've cultured here at Robrosol. So you can see that if you looked at them, you couldn't tell them apart from fibroblasts. Thankfully, we don't have to rely only on our eyes to tell an MSC from a fibroblast. And so for that, in 2006, the International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy put forward four criteria for classifying cells as MSCs. These criteria are, first of all, the ability to grow on and adhere to plastic tissue culture right now. This has a caveat in that when MSCs are grown in serum-free condition, it's necessary to pre-coat the um, surface. The cells will be seeded on with some appropriate ECM coating matrix, but in any case, the cells should be able to grow on your standard run of the mill tissue culture treated, uh, tissue culture wear. The second is that MSC should express the MSC market and those at least for human MSCs are CD73, CD90 and CD105. And of course, if you're working with MSCs from different species, that expression profile will be different. Thirdly, the MSC should not express um, hem hematopoietic cell markers. So this would include CD34, CD45, CD14, among others. And last but not least, the MSCs should possess trilinear differentiation potential. That means that in vitro, the cell should be able to differentiate into adipocytes, chondrocytes, and osteoblasts. And these are all cells in the mesoderm cell lineage. Now here at Repressol Force, we have extensive experience in reprogramming adult cells into iPSCs. And recently we've begun to take those iPSCs and over the course of 30 days, induce their differentiation into mesenchymal stem cells. We've then also maintained these cells in a range of uh, reagents or MSC uh, specific reagents from our 
um, partner, Sartorius, and then we perform various QC tests. Um, as a routine here at Rapusa, we perform uh, cardiology with the cells that we we have uh, available for purchase. This is of course to make sure that the cells maintain a normal thyroid type. And then we perform sterility to exclude the presence of bacteria and viruses, as well as fungi and mycoplasma. We then perform SCR um, analysis, or short time and repeat analysis as a routine part of our work to make sure that the cells that we have derived have an um, identical genetic profile to the original parent iPSC line. Then we perform the flow cytometry, of course, where we're looking at the expression of the MSC markers. We expect that these MSC markers, CD73 and CD90, CD105 should be elevated. CD45, of course, which is our representative hematopoietic cell marker, should be reduced. And last but not least, we perform the trilinate differentiation into those three cell types that I mentioned previously. So uh, we are, of course, very happy and excited to introduce the latest additions to our portfolio here at RepuCell, which are our Repro MSC3 uh, MSC lines. These were derived from our SK003 IPSC line, which is available for purchase on the website. Um, these IPSCs were originally uh, reprogrammed from skin fibroblasts from a female donor uh, using our third generation reprogramming kit also available on the website. And as you can see the picture on the left, on the bottom left, it's an image of the repro MSC. As you can see, they do have the MSC morphology in that they appear spindle-like. And then we perform the karyotyping, and as you can see in the image on the right, that they do have a normal karyotype. Of course, these uh, are female, so of course it looks like a normal karyotype from female cells. Uh, we then performed the flow cytometric analysis again. This time around, we're looking at two markers, CD73 and CD90. Um, and of course, we're expecting CD45 expression to, to, to be minimal or absent. So in the first um, uh, image that you can see, CD73, we have over 90% of the cells expressing this marker. When we look at CD90 expression, we have over 95% of the cells expressing CD90. And when we look at CD45 expression as expected, we have less than 1% of the cells expressing this marker. So three of the four ISCT criteria have already been fulfilled. And next, we perform the trilinear differentiation. So first of all, we're looking at adipocyte der derivation. So over the course of 19 days, we cultured or maintained the cells in adipogenic differentiation media and by day 19, we start to notice the appearance of these lipid vacuoles, which you can see indicated by the white arrows on the figure. So to confirm that these are indeed lipid vacuoles, we fix the cells and stained with oil red O, which specifically stains lipids and lipoprotein. And you can see the presence of the red staining confirms that these are indeed lipid vacuoles. So yes, the cells can differentiate into adipocytes. Next, we performed the chondrocyte uh, derivation in which we cultured the MSCs. Um, so I'll just walk you to this experiment. So in wells A1 through A5, which is on the top denoted by the black arrow, the blue arrow, sorry, the, uh, the contrast is not really good on the screen, but the uh, image, the top arrow, A1 through A5, the MSCs were cultured in regular MSC media, the bottom arrow, well, C1 through C5, the cells were cultured in chondrogenic differentiation media. And after the course of 21 days, the cells were stained with alcyon blue, which specifically stains glycans. And as you can see in well, C1 through 5, the presence of the intense blue staining, which is absent in wells A1 through A5. So that basically tells us again that these cells have been able to differentiate into chondrocytes. And Last but not least, we then performed the osteoblast derivation in which we culture the MSCs in osteogenic differentiation media over the course of 18 days. And after that, we fix and stain the cells in alizarin S stain, which specifically stains for extracellular calcium deposit too. To walk you through the data, the well labeled L on the left, those are our control MSCs in which the cells were maintained in regular MSC media. And the well on the right, which is denoted R, are our experimental wells. And as you can see, there is a marked difference in the intensity of the staining. So, of course, in the right, we have this intense red orange staining. 
indicative of the presence of extracellular calcium deposits, which we would expect from osteoblasts. So I do want to mention that uh, all of these cells were, um, all of these MSCs are cultured in phenol red containing media. But for um, anyone in the audience who is also interested in exosome research where the presence of phenol red is undesirable, we do have these cells also maintained in phenol red conditions. So they've been maintained in phenol red free conditions, cryopreserved in phenol red free uh, cryopreservation media. Um, and these are repro MSC4 uh, MSCs. So these cells have also been maintained. Uh, they've been maintained in this media and they've been put through the same rigorous testing uh, criteria as the repro MSC3. And they're essentially identical, except for the fact that it's completely phenol red free. So um, in addition to um, having our MSCs derived from our IPSC lines available for purchase, we are also able, happily enough, to take your IPSC line of choice and derive MSCs for you. So I just want to highlight some of the MSCs that we have been able to derive in collaboration with a partner company, Pancella, based out of uh, Canada. Um, these MSCs will be available for sale, but just to highlight one of them, these are our PLSX M13-101. Uh, uh, MSC line. And these were derived from a derivative of our SK05 um, IPSC line. And as you can see, the picture, the image on the far left, a uh, picture of the uh, cells, you can see that they do have the uh, MSC morphology. They look like uh, fibroblasts. And when we start to look again at the expression of these uh, markers, so first looking at CD45 expression, of course, as expected, we have less than 2% of the cells expressing this marker. And that's contrasted with CD73 and CD90 expression, where we have over 90% expression of those markers. And in addition to this particular cell line, we also have the PLSX and M13102BC line. And these are MSCs uh, derived from um, MHC class 1 and class 2 no MPSCs. And we also have the PLSX M13105 BC line. So these are also MSCs uh, without the MAT class 1 and class 2 molecules, but also overexpressing IL-10. And these will be available in November for purchase from our website. But again, to reiterate, we can also take your IPSC line of choice and generate MSCs for you. And um, in addition to selling the, the IPSC derived MSCs, we also have reagents to help you with your MSC research. And this is, of course, in collaboration with our partner, Sartorius. And um, so we have the MSC Nutrition uh, Basal Media, which comes along with a supplement mix so they're used together to culture the cells. And these, uh, these particular, this media, I should mention, is xeno-free and serum-free, and is also manufactured on the CGMP condition, so it can easily translate it to cell therapy and clinical applications. And um, I do also want to mention that it's available, the basal media is also available in phenol red free, as a phenol red free uh, formulation as well. So if you would like to use the media uh, for exosome research, we have the media that can help you do that. And um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, um, it's necessary um, sometimes when you're culturing the cells in serum free conditions, to have the cells be on a, a pre-coated surface. And for that, we have the MSC attachment solution also from Sartorius. We've used this particular um, coating matrix successfully to culture both primary and IPSC derived MSCs, and they are xeno-free. And you will be able to purchase them also from our website in November, <laughs> so within the next few weeks. Um, in the future, we also plan to offer some variations on our MSCs. So while I didn't elaborate on this earlier in the talk, um, it's also known that MSCs, like most primary cells, have a finite uh, lifespan. They'll go through a number of passages, so that about from 8 to 12 passages before they become senescent. So especially when um, you're using the MSCs as feeder lines for uh, you know, uh, maintaining T cells or NK cells, it might be desirable for you to want an immortalized uh, cell line to, to reduce batch to batch variation from one uh, you know, derivation to the other. 
And so in this case, you know, there are many um, methods through which you can immortalize the MSCs. Uh, here at Rock Cell, we immortalize the MSCs by overexpressing the human telomerase. So in this particular case, we plan to offer two variations of immortalized MSC lines. The first is a pet inducible telomerase um, cell line, which we uh, introduce these uh, conditional, um, we introduce a tet inducible plasmid into the cells, select them, and by adding by the addition of uh, tetracycline or doxycycline, in case you can turn on the expression of telomerase. We'll also have a fully immortalized MSC line um, in which we introduce uh, telomerase lentivirus expression, um, expression particles. So these two will also be available, we expect, uh, towards the middle of December. And so in conclusion, um, we are very proud and excited to be able to offer you a host of reagents and services to help your MSc research. So we have with iPSC derived MSCs and the reagents to culture those iPSC derived MSCs. Um, I also do want to, to remind everyone that we do offer reprogramming services for your adult cells. And if you are already involved in MSc research, I'm also happy to tell you that we've successfully been able to reprogram these primary MSCs into um, iPSCs. So if that's something that you would want to do with your MSCs, we're more than happy to discuss with you further. And of course, all of these will be available on our website. You should expect to see them within the next two weeks. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and hand the talk off to my colleague, Naira, who will tell you all about the exciting work being done um, at Histocell with research grade, not research grade, but this time clinical grade, we did a research grade, but she um, at Histocell does the clinical grade MSCs and IPSC work. Thank you again for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. My name is Nayara De Paz. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Histocell. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks to all Repercell team for inviting Histocell for this uh, webinar. In this second part of the webinar, I'm going to provide an overview of what is required to use mesenchymal stem cells for clinical projects that basically is a combination of experience, capabilities, and services. Just to um, give you some idea about uh, Histocell, we are a biopharmaceutical CDMO focused on regenerative medicine, and we develop and manufacture cell-based therapies. We are located in the north of Spain, in the Basque country. There is um, well recognized at European level as a biohealth ecosystem. And of course, considering our activity, we are uh, proud of our experience team uh, with different disciplines. And uh, another important uh, point uh, in our business is that uh, we must work under the most demanding international quality standards because we are working for clinical use. This is a brief overview about our history. Just to let you know that Histocell was born as a research company. And we were working in cell therapy projects at preclinical states for many years. And at the end of uh, 2011, we open our first clean room that was small, but it was the first clean room mostly for our own projects that 
uh, started phase one clinical trials. But around 2017, we started receiving requests for manufacturing from third, third parties. So that clean room became quite small. So finally, in the third period of our history, we established a full um, business of, as a CDMO, and we opened a big factory. That is what uh, I'm going to explain you today. Of course, uh, during these years, we have been incorporating valuable partners, pharmaceutical companies, health centers, and of course, uh, very proud to have Ripercell as a histocell partner in this in this business. Well, production of clinical mesenchymal stem cells requires a strong background in cell therapy. That is the first point. In histocell, we achieved that experience after years of work in two main in two main areas, basically working in mesenchymal stem cells and working on oxidative stress. So based on these two topics, we develop our own technology that is HC016, that are mesenchymal stem cells reinforced to survive in the oxidative environments. It is widely known that many therapeutical indications are related with oxidative stress. And it is also well known that mesenchymal stem cells do not survive a lot under this environment. So we developed this technology to be able to enlarge viability and activity of mesenchymal stem cells. We perform phase one and phase two clinical trials with these mesenchymal stem cells for bone regeneration, for acute lung disease, and for spinal cord injury. And we will start working on another uh, indication such as urinary incontinence and orthopedics in, uh, in the near future. Well, we work under two main points in the, in the area of mesenchymal stem cells for clinical use. We maintain our DNA as um, research and development because we're still working on own projects to develop new cell therapy candidates, but we have included strongly our services of CDMO to provide full life cycle or uh, specific services that potential customers could need. Mm, we have um, experience around 13 years working with uh, under EMA regulated scope, of course, um, uh, with the Spanish regulatory agency. And more or less, we have been treated around 300 patients with cells of clinical grade produced at histocell, around 350 batches for different customers, both public and private hospitals, uh, large pharmaceutical companies, or also for small biotech companies. Talking about production of mesenchymal stem cells for clinical use, the first aim must be to reach cell therapies to more patients. Of course, human and animals, because cell therapies are working also for veterinary sector. There are many organizations working on this, startups, small biotechs, large companies, and they need suitable support to move from preclinical stage to clinical stage and hopefully at the end to commercialization. 
going uh, deeper into the type of services that are needed for clinical mesenchymal stem cells manufacturing, first is to define the type of product. In our case, we work both with cell therapy products and also with secretomes. Then it is necessary to establish the type of buds that is needed. Because sometimes um, we need full GMP batches because they are for clinical use, but sometimes there is also interest in obtaining pilot batches, engineering batches, GMP-like batches. There are different ways of naming these pre-GMP batches. Uh, then uh, we should consider that some products needs a development uh, or an optimization phase to start in the GMP environment. Other products will need to develop analytical methods. Um, and of course, we must consider whether this product is going to be allogenic or autologous because the process of scaling up to GMP um, is quite different depending on, on, on the type of, of product. And also um, we must consider if the project of uh, GMP for uh, of mesenchymal stem cells involves only drug substance or also drug product, or if it needed uh, some uh, to create some cell banks or cell stocks, because the, the project will be slightly different depending on these points. To offer this type of services, of course, it is necessary to have suitable facilities, bigger or smaller, but well equipped to both to manufacture and to release clinical grade material. We decided to build a challenging factory about around 600 square meters. It is big but uh, we have the possibility to manufacture from a small to big batches because there are different type of organizations and um, the needs could be uh, really different. This is just to give you an example of a clinical grade mesenchymal stem cell factory. Of course, could be other design. This is our layout. But basically, must include GMP manufacturing suites and associated infrastructure. Clinical mesenchymal stem cells, as you probably know, must be manufactured under grade A because uh, cell products cannot be sterilized. So we must manufacture them under aseptic conditions. We read the grade A um, inside isolators or inside flux, laminar flux cabinets. And in our case, we decided to establish a grade B uh, facility that is uh, highlighted in blue color in the, in the layout because it's uh, one of the best options to manufacture cell therapies that nowadays are quite manually uh, manufacturing processes nowadays. Well, uh, regarding the associated infrastructure, you, you see different colors in green and in orange. So they are basically quality control labs and growing rooms that uh, increase the, the quality of the, of the air as you are entering in the production area that must be aseptic. Well, um, clinical grade manufacturing of mesenchymal stem cells could be focused to products that are under clinical stage, of course, but also products that enter in the commercial manufacturing stage. So this means that 
the facility must be prepared to grow. So in the design of, of a factory, from the beginning, we should consider quite flexible or mobile infrastructure uh, that allow us to open new rooms or that allow us to allocate big equipments. Because um, when you enter in the commercial stage, you may need big spaces or you may need to include new equip equipments as bioreactors, for example, that need uh, a lot of a lot of space. Uh, apart from the facilities, clinical grade manufacturing of mesenchymal stem cells requires a strong quality system because at the end is the is what ensures that the product has been manufactured um, under a septic condition uh, and uh, that fulfills quality and safety requirements. So, Additionally, about uh, apart from the manufacturing rooms, uh, the facility must include quality control labs. Of course, some quality controls can be outsourced or externalized, but in our case, we try to um, uh, perform internally as much uh, uh, as possible. Um, at least uh, some of the microbiolog microbiological size. Uh, we do also biological assays and, and stability studies. So it is uh, one of the um, uh, most important things for uh, uh, CDMO manufacturing of mesenchymal stem cells. So we have talked about facilities, we have talked about quality system, but the, the key element to make possible the release of mesenchymal stem cells for clinical use is their regulatory status. Of course, the factory must, must have a, a, an authorization as a manufacturer. This is our MIA number, the MIA number of HIS2Cell. And uh, it is needed to have the certificate of GMP for the products you are going to manufacture. In our case, we, we already have GMP certification for several products. So we can work with both autologous or allogenic products based on adipose and bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. And we, uh, as in, in our work of CDMO, we are always trying to incorporate new certifications. For example, nowadays we are working to include secretome of mesenchymal stem cells and secretome from the culture of cells and IPSC in our certificate. Regarding the um, specifically the, the manufacturing could be use both for development, for preclinical, and of course, for clinical states. Some customers want to have GMP batches for preclinical studies. It is not compulsory, but some of them requires to have these GMP-like batches manufactured at pilot scale for, for the testing in, in animals. And this implies to have different rooms, quite flexible. In our case, we uh, we have seven rooms uh, available for both for internal and, uh, and external projects with the capability around 1,200 batches per year, more or less. It is also relevant to include in the facilities a pilot plant because some projects require to set up the process. And uh, for example, we have included uh, a pilot plan with a bioreactor or with the capacity to start with the CAR T cells. So you need uh, to have a, a room quite open to different type of projects. 
And finally, it is very relevant to, uh, to have facilities both for autologous and for allogenic therapy, because the, the scaling is very different. For autologous therapy, when a customer wants to, to scale to GMP level, you need basically a lot of rooms, serial rooms to simultaneously process uh, tissue samples. That is basically the strategy to uh, to scale up an autologous process. On the contrary, if you are working uh, in allogenic therapy project, you may probably need to establish first cell banks or cell stocks. So the strategy could be slightly different regarding the, the manufacturing. About the type of media that uh, it's necessary to, to use, it could vary a lot depending on the project, depending on the product, on the customer. So we must, as a CDMO, we must work with different media, with um, fetal bobin serum, with platelet lysate, with Nutri-Stem, and with all of these new new media that are uh, uh, very good for, for mesenchymal stem cells grow. We need to have both normoxic and epoxic conditions because some cells need uh, hypoxic. And of course, we must work with traditional flask or with cell stocks or with bioreactors. So a CDMO must be aware of all this media and all of these devices because its project, it's, uh, it's, it's different. Regarding the future perspectives for a CDMO, the first one is that we must stay up to date and we must adapt because the science of mesenchymal stem cells grows really fast. We have seen in the Evelyn's presentation about new technology for IPSC. So we have be we must be aware about everything. And of course, we must consider as much uh, automatization as possible because uh, cells are uh, quite manual uh, these days, but there are uh, some uh, good equipments, good bioreactors that will be good tools to, uh, to go with um, phase two and phase three clinical trials and also to go through commercialization stage. As I told you before, we must be aware of new certification because we are, nowadays we are not talking only about mesenchymal stem cells, uh, but we have projects uh, about secretomes, about exosomes, about IPSCs. So we must include and validate new processes to obtain new certification. And we must also consider new, new scopes. Because, for example, for veterinary use, that it's uh, uh, a starting market, uh, advanced therapies for, for pets and for other animals. And also we must be aware of different regulation, uh, not only EMA, but FDA or uh, Japanese or, or, or China specific uh, regulation. Well, the best way to face the future of clinical great mesenchymal stem cells manufacturing is to establish a strategic partnerships so here I'm, I'm really happy to show an example of a successful collaboration with Repercell. Both Repercell and Histocell are two companies that are ready to provide full package service for therapeutic application based on iPSCs or mesenchymal stem cells. As we have seen in the Evelyn's presentation, Repercell offers the full packets for research projects regarding technologies for reprogramming, regarding reagents, 
So the whole package for research is um, already established at Repercel. And in our case, we will start working once the, the potential customer um, wants to enter in uh, clinical trials and hopefully in the commercial stage, both um, starting from the technology transfer or scaling or optimization of the process up to the manufacturing of clinical grade iPSCs or mesenchymal stem cells. So this could be a good example about how to deal with the future of this kind of technologies with strategic partnerships. So thank you for your attention. It has been a pleasure to, to join this webinar.